Hello. Hi. How are you, Sarah? Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Krasnstein, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's online author event this evening. Uh, the Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadawurrung and Eastern Mar original owners of the lands on which the library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Mar elders past, present, and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge, and story. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land from which I'm speaking to you tonight in Melbourne, the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Some housekeeping reminders before we get started. You can participate in this live webinar by clicking on the Q&A button and typing in your questions or comments. Uh, you may need to touch your screen to see the Q&A and the chat function if you're using an iPad or an iPhone tonight. Also, this webinar is being recorded, and if you'd like to watch this discussion again and again and again, uh, or recommend it to your friends and family, it will be uploaded to your, fam to your library's YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Uh, before we begin, brief background about myself. I'm the author of The Trauma Cleaner. My new book is called The Believer, and it will be out early next year. I am like Jock, a writer with a background in the law, and a deep interest in our histories, which is why it is such a privilege to launch Jock's beautiful new book tonight. Uh, as authors, we're used to social distancing. We spend years locked away, keeping worlds alive in our heads and worrying about such things as commas. But it is also true that we love to celebrate together at the end of that very long process, mostly for the free wine and cheese. Um, so while I am gutted that we can't be doing that tonight in person, I am really delighted and honored to be uh, celebrating with Jock virtually tonight and launching his newest book. You're all in for a fantastic treat. Jock is one of Victoria's and indeed Australia's favorite authors. He writes across multiple media, and most often about the sea. He lives with his family on Victoria's far west coast and is the editor and the co-founder of the Great Ocean Quarterly and a senior writer for Surfing World. He also contributes to Patagonia's Roaring Journals, The Guardian, The Monthly, The Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and The Australian Financial Review. His novels have received the Ned Kelly Award for First Fiction, the Colin Roderick Award and the inaugura inaugural Staunch Prize in the UK. The burning novel is Jock's fifth novel. It follows uh, the book, uh, his, the previous novel, Preservation, which was based on the true story of the wreck of the Sydney Cove in 1797. In Preservation, we saw Lieutenant Joshua Grayling investigate that story, and in The Burning Island, he returns about 30 years later, this time with his daughter, Eliza, to pursue his old enemy on the trail of a new lost ship around the isolated islands of Bass Strait, on a ship called the Moonbird. The term I'm about to use, I've been told, does not work well with my accent, but I'm going to use it anyway. The book is a bloody ripper. <laughs> it's a propulsive page turner with characters so real and complex that you can see them and it's beautifully written at the sentence level. It's about Australia. It's about the deep violence of colonization to the human world and to the natural world. It's about family, outward and inward exploration the deep sea around us and within us. So with no further ado, congratulations and welcome, Jock. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> thank you so much for all of that. And thank you very much for doing this too, by the way. Oh, and hello, everyone. Um, I was sort of just sitting there basking in that introduction and I drifted off there for a moment. <laughs> but um, thanks heaps. It's lovely to be part of it. But will you kick us off with a little bit of a reading from the book? Sure, sure. I, um, I, I marked a little passage and um, I, I fear this might be one of those things that it seemed to work when I wrote it and we're about to find out whether it works when I read it. Okay. Um, because I haven't before. I don't think I've read this out loud. So um, we'll give it a go and see what happens. Uh, this is Eliza on the boat, which is called the Moonbird, in the middle of the night um, down amongst the islands. I waited several hours on my bed trying to read by lamplight. I closed my eyes a while and opened them. 
There was no rush to visit the doctor. He would be working his secret rituals throughout the night, impervious to time and fatigue. I was restless. I went above. The night was glorious, clear and still. I thought I was alone at first. The lines of the timbers and the rigging making silhouettes against the bright starlit sky. But then I saw that once again, Tarnora was out there too. She had been, been assigned poor Angus Connolly's hammock, but I'd never known her to use it. She seemed to live all her hours on deck. She was standing alone in the dark, one hand on the shrouds to steady her, looking up to the heavens. High beyond the tips of the masts, infinity stretched from horizon to horizon. Aside from the minor rocks that lay dark on the sea, we were suspended between two curving worlds, the stars above and the depths below. The surface was calm enough to reflect the galaxies so that it looked as though the universe swirled all around us above and below, as if up and down had ceased to exist and only all around remained. The moonbird was aloft and freed of its own weight. And directly up there where Tarnora was looking, the Milky Way stretched across the sky, more detailed and vivid and terrifyingly vast than I had ever seen it. I dared not breathe for fear I might distract her, might break the trance of that moment and its eternal assurance that we and our cares and our tiny boat were nothing, a floating dust mote in the stillness. Looking down to the woman before me, I saw ceaseless motion. Her head twitched between points and when it turned far enough, I could see that her eyes too were darting about. She was following movements I could not see, happenings, events. I did not know what, like anyone else watching boxes or shoals of fish or children playing. Her face was reacting with fright, amusement, wonder and sorrow. Tiny changes, but unmistakable ones. Her free hand rose involuntarily once or twice as if something startled her. But for all my squinting and staring, I could see only the beautiful speckled stillness. Oh, thank you. So <clears throat> we'll be taking uh, and incorporating some questions from the audience as um, we move, as we get a little bit deeper into the conversation. So around eight o'clock. So you've got some time to get your questions for Jock in. Um, oh, Gail has said, beautiful Jock. Just oh, thank you, Gail. <laughs> um, so I was thinking, it's hard to articulate that thing that clicks inside when we find a subject that we're pulled towards. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because as well as being of intellectual interest, there's kind of a deep um, personal pull there. And there has to be in order to sustain that level of attention to detail that's almost obsessive over the time required to write a book like this. Um, so can you take us to how, how it first started, the desire to kind of learn about and then to write about this time and place? Yeah, I, I think um, personally it goes back into my early adulthood. I've been going to and from these islands um, ever since my early 20s and um, I've always been fascinated by them because it's a combination of the fact that they're physically beautiful. Um, they're just gorgeous places to be and to walk and swim and do all these things. Um, but equally, there's a dark history under them and it's really important Australian history and it's not widely discussed. And I've always had this conflict in me about the fact that um, I love the place and I'm, um, I'm puzzled, I suppose, that we don't talk about the place more and the impact that it's had. And, um, you know, the, the question's often asked, what, how, how do you sustain interest in a topic over the enormous distance of writing a novel, in the marathon that it is? Um, and I think the answer is you have to go to those things that you feel that way about, that you've just referred to, that if you don't, there's really not um, the fuel to keep you going through through the long haul. And, and for me, um, the islands have that. And I've been out there on boats at night and I've been there through hot days and storms and, and all these different conditions. And um, that really lends itself to contemplating the place. And, and I suppose somewhere in the back of my mind, I've been storing up all of these words for years and years and years. And um, it's almost lovely to finally lay them all down and, and have a long, hard think about how I do feel about the place. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I was uh, I'm very uh, neurotic and wanting to follow my chronology, but what you said just reminded me of something that I was thinking the whole way through the book, um, which was, you know, I 
despite my very awkward accent. I was <laughs> born, uh, but I've been here for 20 years. And I was kind of struck by, you know, my father's family's from Australia. Um, I've lived in Victoria since the mid nineties. And the, the, the geography of, of the book, like the, the setting, which is all, so powerful, it's almost like its own character in the book, ab over and above being the setting for the action. Um, and I was surprised at my own unfamiliarity with these places, particularly juxtaposed against their, their historical significance, which is what you were just touching on. I mean, why do you think it is that they've kind of just fallen out of the, the, the stories that were told about where we come from and what this place is? Um, I think there's one particular reason for that, and I'll come to it. Um, there's a period of 50 years between 1797, which is when the Sydney Cove was wrecked in the Ferno Islands, and 1847, which was the end of the attempt to settle Aboriginal people in the islands. There's these 50 years when they were really central to um, Australian history because the wreck of the Sydney Cove brought about the discovery of seals. It brought about the discovery of coal on the coast of southern New South Wales um, and forestry. And in fact, it led to the discovery of Bass Strait. It led to Flinders being there and finding this passage. And then in the 1810s, 1820s, you had all of the sealers coming down and trying to exploit the seals and, and ultimately driving some of the species to local extinction. And then in the 1830s and 40s, George Augustus Robinson brings in Tasmanian Aborigines, um, allegedly on the basis that he was saving them and Europeanizing them and Christianizing them, where in fact, what he was doing was condemning them. And when that settlement ended in ignominy and failure, then that's the close of that 50 year window. And really, if you think about the people involved, there's the Tasmanian Palawa people who have indeed continued to try and tell and retell this history. There's the sealers who were often people who were, if not on the run, they certainly didn't want any attention drawn to what they were doing. Um, and then there's really only George Augustus Robinson, the missionary, to tell the story of what was going on. And it was very much in his interests to tell a particular type of story. He was a propagandist in the end. He wanted he wanted it known that he was the saviour of the Palawa peoples and that um, his mission was a success. He went on to then do similar things in Victoria. Um, so his narrative has come to take over and to dominate the story of the islands in those years. And it's, it's not by any means um, the only story or indeed the right story. And that's one of the things that I wanted to start looking at in this novel was um, how do we really know we've been told the truth and what other perspectives on that time might there have been? Yeah. 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 Is it, you know, that, that, that practice of right of conjuring this kind of this fictional world within the historical constraints seems to me, I'm a writer of nonfiction, so, um, difficult and such a fine balance. What, were there, can you kind of walk us through what, what the process is from that kind of marinating in those primary sources and all of the materials that are in the archives and using them to bounce off and kind of, you know, realize this three-dimensional world? Like, what's that process like? Well, it's funny, you and I have had that chat in the past about the fact that I would be petrified of writing nonfiction. And I think the, the inverse might apply. Um, I, I think it's very instinctive in the sense that you do, you have a set of primary sources and you have certain peaks and landmarks in, in the so-called true story that you want to touch upon. Um, and often it's because they're so damn bizarre that you can't, it, it's almost unbelievable that they, they're part of the story, you know, and stuff that you make up is not really going to stack up to what the truth appears to be. Um, so all of the time as the story is unfolding, you're juggling okay, I want to use this bit of Robinson or I want to use this bit of some other settler or sealer or an, an Aboriginal source. Um, equally here, there is a gap and I want to walk into that gap and, and make up a story. And when I do it, I want it to be something that launches off the evidence in a kind of plausible way. Um, something that history suggests could have been the case, like Tanora being on the boat, I suppose. Um, and then sometimes also you just want to completely let the wheels spin and just riff and, and just dream about things. Um, 
And I think that provided you're doing it in an honest way so that the reader is not being misled in some fundamental sense, then that's okay. And that's an appropriate blend of those things. But um, it takes a bit of thinking and indeed a lot of rereading of your own work to say, hang on, you know, this is a blind alley. Um, I need to, I need to go back and rewrite this part. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the glory of the archives, which is also the tragedy, which is there's so many interesting rabbits to chase down all the interesting holes. And if you were to do that, you'd never finalize any piece of work. Um, so when do you draw the line and when do you, was there anything, um, like any of those kind of golden nuggets that didn't make it into this? Yeah, there were heaps actually. Um, sometimes I, I think you, you know that the story needs a particular bit of research and you go looking for that thing, but you wind up finding something else down the rabbit hole and lo and behold, you, you're reverse engineering your story to try and get that thing into it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there were, there were probably dozens of weird and wonderful little artefacts of, of misguided research that I threw in. And um, in editing with Mandy and, and just in rereading, they, they gradually fall away, which kind of hurts. I used to just run the highlight through them and delete them. But um, over the last couple of years, I've tried to develop the habit of building this deleted scenes file so that all of those little deciduous bits are being kept for, I don't know what rainy day, but some rainy day. Mandy, Jock and I have the privilege of sharing the same editor, and the wonderful Mandy Brett. And she says, uh, you know, nothing's wasted. I look forward to seeing it again someday. <laughs> <laughs> it makes the pain slightly uh, less acute. <laughs> when it it's there somewhere. Um, I was so struck by how you write about the ship, the Moonbird. Both, both the ship itself and also the birds that it's named after and this idea that runs throughout the text of return um, over great distance. It, can you speak a little bit um, about that and whether it might be related to the, ep I, I will always muck up the word, the, ep the epitaph at the beginning, yeah. um, this idea of, of return. Yeah, um, the, the epigraph is from Omar Saker's poem, Sailor's Knot. And um, I, I don't know that it ties directly to the narrative in any way, other than I felt it, it extraordinarily, it really captured the mood of what I was writing. And, and Omar was writing about a different time and place. Um, and he and I are very different people. But um, yeah, I was surprised by how he had somehow... Um, said what I was trying to say in 100,000 words, he'd done it in about 16. Um, and th this idea of return, the, the shearwaters are incredible animals in that they migrate every year from Southern Australia up into the Arctic Circle, up around Siberia and Alaska, and they come back and they come back to the same burrow. And um, there's all sorts of beautiful metaphors that spin off that as an idea. But there was a belief, and this is, this is an example of one of those weird little esoteric things that turn up in research. There was a belief at the time of this setting that the moon had come from the earth and that it indeed had come from the Pacific and that the Pacific Ocean is the moon's void and that um, shearwaters were called moonbirds because of the fact that they traced the rim of the crater that was left by the moon's departure. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose I turned that over and over in my head and I couldn't think of any enormous significance behind that as a notion, but I just loved it. I just I thought it had this lovely symmetry about it. So I think I, I put it into Dr. Gideon's mouth. Uh, it's, um, and the, I won't, I'm going to muck up the Latin. <laughs> the, could, could you say, could you explain for, so that's not, that's the, you know, it's kind of the, it comes right after the epigram, uh, the epigraph at the beginning. Um, Edom mutata resurg resurgo? Resurg yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, although changed, I rise the same. Is that connected to it or is it kind of the, uh, this idea of, you know, the pursuit, uh, the chase of um, railing through these books? Where, what, where did that come from? Yeah, it, it is that. Um, it, it is uh, a reference to anyone who's read Preservation will remember Mr. Fig. Um, it, it's a reference to him. Um, 
The words actually come from the gravestone of a guy called Bernoulli, who was a Smith, <laughs> a Swiss mathematician. And um, he was somebody who studied Fibonacci sequences and spirals. And um, I very, very quickly get out of my depth talking about this stuff. But um, Dr. Gideon on the Moonbird is interested in spiral geometry. And he wants to study paper nautiluses, which are they're a cephalopod. They're related to squid and, and octopuses. And um, he's fascinated by the spiral of the shell and, and what it might tell science. Um, and so in reading about paper nautiluses and the geometry of their shell and, and then spirals and then um, the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio, that all led me down one of these um, typical rabbit holes to Bernoulli. And then I read about his gravestone, which has this um, epitaph on it about rising again. And it just seemed to fit beautifully with what I was trying to do with the characters um, in three small words. And, and I think, um, you know, the book has these echoes. Um, and in, in it, one of the characters says something just so striking about how the islands themselves are kind of, and the people on them are stuck there like family is stuck together. And it brought to mind also the way in which, you know, People are stuck on this ship. Um, you know, the, this idea of, you know, the, the spiraling away, to, away from something only to return to it perhaps differently because of the, the journey that, it took, that you've taken away and back. And the relationship between the father and the daughter, between his alcoholism, I mean, addiction, compulsion, it was beautifully interwoven, all of these um, themes and echoes that kind of, well, I don't know, once you start thinking about spirals, everything, everything is a spiral. But I found it um, very, very moving. There's a, a scene early on when Eliza is sort of verbally sparring with Dr. Gideon and he's explaining to her the way he's drawn the intended path of their voyage on a chart and it forms a spiral or, or even a bass clef. And, um, she's trying to be witty with him and, and joust a bit with him until she realizes that the problem with the spiral is that its motion is only ever tighter and tighter inwards. And she has this moment of panic and she says to him, but how will we get home? Oh. And um, I, I felt like that was the moment when she started to sense that she was getting out of her depth with this person. Um, and indeed with the voyage. Um, spirals, yeah, that, they have some interesting connotations like that. Um, I'm going to take this question from Gail because it relates to one that I was about to ask um, and she's phrased it so, so much um, better. So in looking at um, The Burning Island and Preservation and the three novels that came before, Gail wants to know what made you break your tradition of writing each novel in a different genre? Do you plan to stick with historic fiction now? Um, I was curious about you know that that shift in times. I mean, I think it's funny as well. I don't know if you want to incorporate some of this in your answer, but like, do you think in terms of genre, or do you just think this is the book I need to write now? Yeah, very much the latter. Um, I think questions of genre are really questions for um, librarians or um, booksellers or publishers to think about ways in which to present a story to the public. But I think um, as an author either the story's got enough heft in it or it hasn't. And again, that comes back to, you know, the long journey and being sustained over the long journey. And um, I, I, I'm always interested in, in the idea of the boundaries of crime fiction. Where does crime end and historical fiction begins or literary fiction takes over? Um, there are crimes in this book and um, I've never thought of it as crime fiction. And, and indeed, it looks historical, but some of the issues like addiction and about the relationships between fathers and daughters are issues that are entirely contemporary. Um, the notion of being confined, you know, we're all um, confined to one extent or another at the moment. And um, there's people confined on that boat. Um, there's people, as you said, confined on islands and having to tolerate people that they might hate. Um, so those are things that just swirl around genres rather than necessarily observing the tropes. Yeah. Um, and I think if the next book went off in some other direction that turned out to be a rom-com, then I'll go there if the story is interesting enough to me. 
it's it's funny because you know it like it is a question of where is this going to be shelved and we can put this in so many different places and i don't think the brain um thinks in those terms for better or worse it sometimes would be much easier if you set out to do this and there was the the precedent um which leads me into this other question from, hold on, I want to get the name right. Sorry, I'm trying to <laughs> navigate the screens. I'm not a very technologically savvy person. That's uh, why I've got my copy printouts. Um, from Andrew, how much influence did your legal career have on your writing? Which is something that I was thinking about. This this question of, you know, you mentioned earlier, looking looking through the material and seeing, you know, not not so much as evidence, but you know, what support is there for certain claims? Um, you're not subjecting it to kind of a forensic analysis to those standards, but in a, it, it has a similar kind of factual finding process. So, the logic of the law, the process of the law, does has that helped or hindered as you write these books? Yeah, um, my legal career is sort of receding further and further into the distance now, but I, I think there are habits that have stuck from it. And um, some of them are really prosaic things. Like I, I suppose I work a reasonably organized and regular day. I'm not kind of off on whiskey benders. Um, but yes, there is that that tendency to want everything to be supportable. You know how, how lawyers operate in that way that um, they'll never make an assertion without knowing that there's an evidentiary basis underneath it somewhere. Even um, in my case, if the assertions are fictional ones, I, I need to know that there is that structure beneath it. Um, so I think those things probably matter a lot. And, and the other thing I remember, I did a lot of, of crime um, as a lawyer and I remember being struck by the way people were when they were in distress. And um, you saw a lot of it doing that work. And that has really stayed with me that um, in trying to depict people who are going through trauma in my writing, I suppose it still feels fairly immediate. I can still kind of see it and hear it. Um, uh, other than that, I suppose a lot of the other things about being a lawyer, yeah, I, I, I'm finding harder and harder to grasp now. It's been seven years since I left. Um, and it, it's kind of surprising in your life to think that you had this entirely other profession and this other existence. <laughs> no spiraling back. Don't return. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, I think what makes sense um, in a narrative structure or what makes emotional sense might sometimes fall short of what makes, you know, evident, like what could qualify as hard, hard fact, hard evidence. Um, and like you said earlier, if something, as long as you're honest with your readers about what you're doing and when you're doing it, that's all, um, I think, part of the glory of, of being able to tell stories. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think um, it, it even extends as far as the ways in which you use violence in a story that um, I, I get cross when I see violence used in ways that that's purely demonstrative or gratuitous, you know, I, I think um, violence has a place in storytelling and, and that place is to advance character or to um, illustrate injustice or whatever the thing might be, but um, that there has to be a reason why you're doing it. Um, even if it's the most egregious violence, it has to have some kind of explanation underneath it. Yeah, and I mean, and that's the the glory of uh, I think the having the space to do the the contextual work that doesn't explain any, it doesn't excuse any of it, but it explains it in human terms that people start thinking. I mean, they can make judgments as much as they want, but also it kind of becomes more human in that in that respect. Um, and it's not just gratuitous. It's not just you know of um, freakish interest, but rather something that says says something important about human behavior. Um, yeah, I don't think if you've kind of worked worked in that professionally, deal with it flippantly going forward. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think it's something that stays with you that that sense of of not using it lightly. Um, I'm taking a shift. Lorraine would, has asked, would you describe this book as hard to write or did it just flow out of you? I love that. I love, like, I feel like if I say that, I might attract some of it. Uh, and how would you compare it to the rules of backyard cricket in terms of ease or difficulty? Um, 
the rules of backyard cricket was one that did flow. Um, I, I was utterly amazed that I would walk to a desk day after day with that story and it just kept rolling along. And, and it's not something I can explain or rationalise. There's not a technique to it. Um, that story just kept coming. Even the structure of it was, was clear to me when I started. Um, I don't, maybe, you know, you only get one of those in a career, I don't know, but um, this was, uh, it, it was not, um, I wasn't getting stuck, I wasn't getting confused, but by the same token, um, I felt a lot of pressure to get it exactly right. And so I kept going back over my own steps and, and re-evaluating, you know, have I said this the way it needs to be said? Do I know it to be correct? Um, so that stop start motion, I suppose, can get in the way of just the, the momentum and the thrill of storytelling. And um, you have to try and be a little bit kind to yourself and just trust yourself and keep going forwards rather than constantly stepping backwards and rechecking everything. That was really, I think, the impediment in writing this book. But um, beyond that, um, it's, there's all sorts of voyage metaphors, but the um, the direction of the story was pretty clear to me from the outset. I, I don't think any of them are ever going to compare to backyard cricket again in that sense, though. Yeah, like that's just uh, fantastic. It's like the like I think it was Coleridge that went to sleep and dreamt Kublai Khan the poem, and it just came to him in a dream. Sometimes, <laughs> maybe tonight's the night. It'll come fully formed. <laughs> You're so much more cultured than I am because when I try to think of an example of that, I always come up with Keith Richards and the, the riff for satisfaction, um, which is nowhere near as cool. <laughs> I think they were both into hard drugs though. Colored, colored. <laughs> um, I, this is anonymous, very good question. Jock, has COVID-19 been good for your writing or otherwise? <laughs> for example, has it made it easier to imagine a simpler yet more dangerous life in the days gone by? That's a great question. It is a great question. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first part of it, though, um, it would be a terrible thing to own to say that this has been a bonanza. Um, it, uh, it, it's in, in some ways, there's not been much change to my working life. Um, the things that I need in order to do what I do are close at hand and I've never really, other than the needing to see my publisher and to go to book events, I've never really had a great need to be elsewhere. So um, in that sense, it's fine. And um, if anything, um, the prolonged periods of, of relative isolation um, have been good for reading and exploring music and writing and, and those things are all really constructive. Um, it's been different with the kids at home over long periods, um, but I'm lucky enough that I'm working in a shed in the backyard and uh, so I can sort of scuttle out here and do my thing. Um, it's been a beautiful winter on the ocean and that's been a bit of a help. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I've been extremely fortunate in that sense. Um, my wife's a healthcare worker and she's been okay and safe and um, the people around us and the people we love have been safe, but it's impossible to say all of that without looking at the wider picture of how much other people have suffered and um, how much stress various people are under in their jobs. And, and I'm not one of them. So um, yes, I've had a good stretch, but um, I'm keenly aware that that's, that's not universal at all. Um, I wanted to, so we've got a lot of questions, just generally everybody, where I'm going to do my best to get as many of them in, in the time that we have. Um, Richard's asked about the surfer writer thing, which is more interesting, I think, to me than the lawyer writer thing. How did, how <laughs> you, how did you talk? Um, the surfer writer thing. Well, um, I think it's interesting that, that when you go surfing, you're really only spending a couple of seconds standing up, or at least if you're me, that, that's about all you can hope for. Um, the rest of the time you're paddling and really paddling and sitting, it's just walking, only you're doing it in a prone position. And any activity that, like walking, any activity that is semi-physical and kind of rhythmic um, and that you can do inside your own head is going to be really, really helpful for creative things. Um, so I, I think there is definitely a correlation between surfing and, and creative thinking. It helps to clear out the kind of chatter and the clutter in your head. Um, it keeps you away from bloody devices, which has got to be a good thing. Um, 
but I don't think there's any unique magic to surfing. Um, anything that you can do in the outdoors and that has that semi-physical quality to it, just, you know, getting your pulse up slightly uh, and clearing out your head and allowing your mind to drift is always going to help a lot. Um, so, yeah, I'm really glad it's there in my life. I could imagine there could be other things that could do the same job. Um, I'm pretty firmly convinced that golf wouldn't be one of them, but... Um, <laughs> I'm just very, very glad that I've got surfing for however many years I've still got it. Um, I'm gonna, I'm doing my best to get through all of these questions. I just had one more that I could have asked at the beginning and I just wanted to kind of close off because a couple of the questions are coalescing around it and I think we can flow into them from here. Yeah. Um, the world that's, you know, you create and reflect in this book is a spacious one, it's plural, it's racially diverse, it's diverse in gender and experience, which is to say that it's it's real in ways that have been more commonly erased from our received stories and our received histories. Did you come across any kind of primary sources that we're not really um, familiar with in our more standard histories of the country? Um, ways in which we could maybe learn our history in a smarter and more accurate way that would encompass all of these characters that you bring into, into the story? Um, it's a really interesting question. And I think one of the things that Bruce Pascoe taught us with Dark Emu is that some of it's under our noses anyway. Yes. Um, some of these primary sources have been there all along, but we were reading them in the wrong ways. Um, and in particular, you know, I'm referring to explorers and settlers diaries. Um, with Robinson, he, um, to his eternal credit or damnation, he diarised everything he did. So there's thousands and thousands of pages of his thoughts about just about everything. Um, and you get a very, very complete sense of this complex guy. So um, you could rummage around in Robinson's writings and find one version of him or um, approaching it with a different set of eyes, you could find a completely different man. And maybe that's what's happening more widely with Australian history, that we are now starting to go over the same ground, but with different eyes. Um, and, and I think it's a really, really positive development. There's so much good history. Um, you know, over recent months, there's been Kate Grenville's book. There's been Mirandi Rewo writing Stone Sky Gold Mountain. Um, these are works that are looking at history that we think we know about, but in these completely new ways that um, are good for all of us. And, and it helps to advance the kind of difficult conversations that um, certain sections, sectors of our media are perhaps not bothering with. Yeah, yeah. Um, J Jane has asked, I love, well, I love that you realised the first character is a woman by page two. Was the first page first in the writing? Ah, <laughs> I have to think about that. Um, I, I have this problem that sometimes people ask, how long did it take to write the novel? And I can never remember at what point I started writing it because often um, you're carrying around a series of thoughts or phrases or images for a few weeks and then you jot them down somewhere and then you lose the piece of paper and then you type it in and then you can't work out where you saved it. and then one day you get a good run at it and that becomes a chapter. And then you may build off that first bit of writing in either direction. You may build forwards or backwards. So it's uh, as much as it's hard to know when you started writing the novel, it's also very hard to know where you started the novel. My suspicion is that I would have collected a series of the really strong mental impressions that I had, you know, probably describing bits of geography more than anything. Or um, I know I started on the boat early because I was interested in the idea of what the boat would be. Yeah. Um, I suspect that, no, I didn't start anywhere near page one. But having said that, <laughs> I don't know where I did start. Is, and is that kind of process or the, the, has that been the, the same across all five books? Yeah, except Backyard. Again, that that was something where um, the, the initial idea was there's a guy in the boot of a car on the Geelong road and he's headed for a bad death. And uh, I'm going to tell the story of why he's in the boot. So that one literally did start at the start. Um, otherwise, yeah, I think the strongest way, because it's very hard to break the inertia of starting a long story. And if you try to get page one right and open up the universe at a given arbitrary point, it's really hard to do. Um, and so you put it down and you go and do something else. 
But if you start with the things that strike you most forcefully in an emotional and intellectual sense, then you get those things down and then you start to worry about the linkages and, and the flow of the narrative. That stuff will grow over time. But you break inertia by, by grabbing the butterflies that are kind of flittering around you. More intuitive process than most Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. Comfortable with. Got to give into it. Um, Mark has asked, what were the easiest and hardest aspects of writing a sequel? Oh, um, I wonder if that's Mark Smith because he, he's Mr. Sequels. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the hard things were, I suppose, establishing how wedded you are to what you wrote before. Yeah. And um, I remember early on talking to Michael Hayward at Text about this. He said, don't, don't call it a sequel and, and don't call three books a trilogy. Let's call them a book cycle. And I remember thinking it was an odd term, but I think I'm starting to come to a better understanding of what he meant, which is that you can write a series of books about a topic, um, about a time and a place, or even about a group of characters that are not strictly sequential. Um, you don't have to tie off every loose end. You don't have to explain what happened to every person. You can move through that sequence um, in a way that, that links up in little tangents, in, in, in um, little threads, and it's still satisfying to a reader of both books. So I hope that this one works in its own right as a story. Um, and equally, I hope that it delivers uh, some kind of development of the things that I was working on in preservation. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, the, the easy thing is that you already have a world in a sense, although the world of the Burning Island is quite different to the world of preservation. The hard thing is knowing just how strictly to link the two things together. So this leads me into asking about what you're currently working on. Um, uh, Jane would like to know, is there a third book? Where does Eliza end up? My <laughs> so, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about, about what's next? I can. Um, I'll be careful with the characters, but um, going back to what I was talking about earlier about this idea of a 50 year window with the Furno Islands, they kind of, they just went to sleep after 1847 and, and they are now the most lovely laid back quiet place. Um, but 1847 is, is the kind of end of my window of history where the Wybalina settlement closed and what I want to write about is Wybalina and um, the things that went on there. And it's very, very troubled history. It's very contentious history. Um, there's an excellent doco called Black Man's Houses that was made by Steve Thomas in about 1990, which explains all of this, um, the, the old history and the modern history of the Wybalina site on Flinders Island. And um, the, the, the pain and the scarring of that episode of history has never really been resolved um, to this day. And uh, part of me thinks that an important response to that as a writer is to engage with it and talk about it and, and try to kick off a discussion. Um, another part of me thinks, well, um, why do you think you're entitled to raise that topic and to talk about it? It's, um, it's a thorny business, but uh, it's such an important story. And I guess you can look at all sorts of episodes in Australian history in the same way that um, on the one hand, it is easier to leave these things sleep. And on the other hand, if we keep doing that, then how are we moving any of our big discussions forward? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I um yeah no I agree. Um, this is a lovely question. Julie has asked you when you were in the midst of writing. Can you read for leisure or is it distracting? <laughs> I find it really strange the way some people say that they they must not read or they must not read a particular author while they're writing. Not at all. It might somehow eke its way in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read all sorts of stuff while I'm writing a novel and indeed I, I love to do it. It's, it is still um, the escape and the relaxation that it was when I was working as a litigator. I, I, um, I just love to be in someone else's world for a little while. And one of the great things I think about um, having a publisher and, and being a part of, of this career is that um, people send you books and 
the great thing about that is that if I walked into a bookshop in the past, there were particular authors I would go straight to and my, my choices of reading were really conservative. Um, I was a sucker for a good cover and I still am, but really I, I had pretty bland instincts about my reading. And now um, people send you books for various reasons, whether it's to review them or blurb them or um, because they're part of, of text publishing's stable. And it means that you're reading much more diversely and your ideas are being challenged and um, you have all sorts of surprises. So that part of it's just lovely. And I think at the moment I was looking the other day, there's, there's probably four or five books that I'm trying to read simultaneously. And um, I'm in the very happy position that I never quite know which one to pick up because they're all fantastic. Do you, um, do you read, do you have a question on fiction and fiction? Like, do you have one on the go or do you like alternate or is there kind of more intuitive? What's your. Yeah. Um, both. And um, I think I always try to have a novel on the go because part of you is reading. Um, I, I should qualify what I said before. Part of me is reading for relaxation. Part of me is reading in a kind of structural way to think about where all the strings and the sticky tape are. And, and I'm interested in, in other people's language and how they pull off certain feats. Um, so whatever mix of things I might be reading, there will always be a novel among them. And I try to move between current releases and old novels to look at how things have been done down through traditions. Um, I think there's also this really fascinating tendency to read in strings where a book leads you to a book leads you to a book and um, that can take you into really interesting places. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any particular rule about fiction and nonfiction other than I like to have a novel somewhere near me in that mix. And can you, can you turn off that kind of writerly work analysis um, eye and just enjoy it as a reader or are you kind of always live to what's going on? <sighs> I don't know. I, I think, um, I mean, I'm interested in what you think about this, but I reckon that the better the, the story is, um, the less inclined you are to think structurally. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it has more of an ability to take you into uh, a dream state and that's the great power of it. Um, yeah, I'm not very good at switching off. And, and sometimes, you know, despite what I've just said, if a novel is extraordinarily good, then you go into that other mode of how on earth are they doing this? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah you suspend disbelief and then you, you resume it again yeah it is uh and, and yeah no i i definitely feel that i you know if you're kind of reading you're just kind of marinating in the language or the you know the structure in the sense that it's such a light touch that you don't even notice it and then you think, oh, hold on, wait, I got to figure it out. What are they doing here? And then I kind of get the pen out. And then, <laughs> but, but does the same thing apply with nonfiction, Sarah? Is that how it works with your reading and writing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it's a broad church nonfiction. So, I mean, it's always my favorite shelf at the bookshop or a library because it's got everything, depending on how much the person who made the shelf loves nonfiction, it will have everything on it from like history to cooking or crafting. Or we'll have, you know, these kind of stories of different people's lives or, you know, what we call narrative nonfiction where it reads like a novel. And so it depends where the book falls on that spectrum. But I mean, if I, if I'm just so drawn to it because of the story, yeah, I kind of, it will be done before I realized what, it, what has happened. Um, and then I'll go back and I'll try to mine it for, for you know, techniques or skills or um so you're if, if i may bust open what you're up to you've, you've collected what six stories together that you have linked what is it about them that that says that these are the six why do you pick those particular stories this is what i tried so I, I, it's probably just my interest and thank you we're going to get, get back to all the infinity <laughs> questions this is the mess he's very lovely it's just my, my interest at the end of the day, I think that links them together, hopefully. Um, but um, there are stories of kind of people's different beliefs in um, the unknown or the things that we all struggle with, death, injustice, um, uncertainty, and then kind of figuring out, you know, why I'm interested in this in the first place. So always more interesting to find out from other people though. What, what but that's so many stories, like how do you stop at six? 
Oh, no. I mean, there were so many that didn't even make it in. That's the thing. So many stories out there. And that for any aspiring writers, and I'm going to ask Jack about this more specifically in a second, the, the notion that, you know, we find stories and it's just luck, or right? Like you came across this wonderful idea and it's never going to happen again. You're five books into it. Um, and, you know, I tell myself because I, I'm telling, you know, other, maybe making the point so I can kind of remind myself that it's a way of looking at the world. Stories is a way of looking at the world. You put on the right glasses and there are more stories than there are people. So, you know, I think we always have to be live to the fact that there's so much more out there. Um, but, you know, we'll see by the time, hopefully I'm up to my fifth book. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so this is a very, uh, Probing question from Cameron. What's the furthest you've been into a new novel before eventually abandoning it? And I don't know if it means reading it or writing it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, how early have I walked out of films? I, I've never abandoned a novel. I think um, the way that the early processes work is that um, I make folders in the computer all the time where um, I, I've heard an interesting phrase or I've overheard it, or I've read something that's intrigued me, and I'll make a little folder and keep the basic ideas. And then um, I imagine it's, it's like the way lint gathers. Sometimes other things in your life will then attach themselves to that idea. And I know that I made a folder somewhere about that thing or something related to it, and I'll add it on. And over a year or two years or three years, the lint ball gets very, very big. And um, eventually you reach a critical mass where you think there is now enough in this thing and there's enough other concepts attaching itself to the thing that it's a goer. And um, I think if you start with that very long gestation, you never reach a point where you're halfway, you know, you're 40,000 words into a story and the things are done. Yeah. Um, because you've satisfied yourself before you started that it's got heaps of juice in it. Um, and, and so there's, there's this whole list of folders in the computer, which some of which just have three lines in them and, and some of which have six or eight or 10 pages of ideas threaded out. Um, the difficulty I think is choosing among them. And, and sometimes that's a mood thing. You go to one on a particular day or listening to particular music and you think, yep, that's it. That's, that's going to be next. That's going to keep me for two years. Um, and then on another day, it might be an entirely different set of ideas. Um, but happily so far, I've not got to the point of being halfway in and jumping over the side. Good, good lesson about keep on paddling, keep on paddling. <laughs> it's just paddle. Um, Jane has asked two questions. The first is when, when did you decide to write as Eliza and was it a challenge? And the second one is what or where is the island on the cover? Ah, the island on the cover um, is the work of Mr. Chong from Text Publishing, and I don't know. Um, I love it. It's it's sort of moody and dramatic. There's always a strange thing that happens with covers that um, in the long haul of writing a story, you have a very, very strong set of visuals in your head. And the problem with somebody designing you a cover is that it is never, ever going to accord with the pictures in your head. So um, there comes a day where you get an email and the email says, um, please see our idea for your cover below. And you scroll down with kind of all of these mixed feelings crushing in on you. And then you see a picture and, and you react. It's, it, I was watching last night um, the Ahn Doe painting show and he gets to the end and there's always a reaction shot. And it's the one thing I really hang out for is the reaction shot because I'm dying to know how they're going to pull it off. Um, but there is a reaction moment when someone else's idea of the visuals comes into collision with your own. And um, there's absolutely no point rationally in worrying about your own reaction. What you have to do is think about it slowly over the, the following days or weeks, the, the rational reasons why that image has been chosen, what it meant to someone else as a designer, what it might mean to a reader, how well it telegraphs the story, all of these things. Um, and I think this image does that job just superbly. It's, um, it sets a mood. Yeah. And it's, I think if we we're visual thinkers, we wouldn't need this many words for the story. We'd just be Chong and be like, this is the story. 
and it's it's right and it's a visual talent um yeah quite incredible and i'm just i'm reading um a collection of essays by john freeman um called how to read a novelist and they're just they're not essays they're, they're extended interviews with authors and Chong has drawn a cartoon of each and every one of these authors, and there might be a hundred of them. Um, and they're just beautiful. The, the, the range of his talents is quite extraordinary. And if you look across the text catalogue, there's not two books that look the same, and yet so many of them are his work. Yeah, it's like the, the Beatles. They all, all, every song is different, but they're all Beatles. You all know it's a Beatles song. Um, and then Start it again with the references. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all the Beatles I, I think. I don't know if Chong's going to like that comparison. Um, and Jane, so the strong female oh, yeah. protagonist. And yeah. Um, that'll be our last question. Maybe. Well, um, I think the first thing to observe about that is that a little bit like preservation, if I didn't make a conscious effort to write such a character, the parameters of the story are extremely male and um, that could have got monotonous pretty quickly. So that was one thing. The other thing um, was that readers of Preservation will recall Charlotte. Um, and without giving anything away, I wanted to continue, I suppose, the arc of Charlotte um, through her daughter. Uh, and, and so to me, it was an obvious instinctive choice that um, Charlotte had a daughter and that the daughter would be central to this story. Um, I think they're the two main things that, you know, this was a bunch of blokes on a boat otherwise, and um, a bunch of blokes on a boat um, can get monotonous pretty quickly. Um, I, but I'm going to wrap up in one minute, just to keep this very short. Final question. We've got a lot of aspiring um, and early emerging writers who are asking some questions. And I think just write your best writerly advice to people at an early point in their career? Um, um, I think it's a combination of two things. One is that you have to back yourself against the whole world. Um, there's plenty of long hours of, I'm no good at this, this story's a dud, um, no one's going to be interested, no one reads novels anymore. Um, you, you can spend hundreds and hundreds of hours assailing yourself with those thoughts. Um, and at some stage, you've just got to be a little bit tough about that and say, it's me against the world and I'm going to keep doing this and I'm not going to be told otherwise. There, there's that level of stubbornness that is really necessary. The other side of that, and it's completely contradictory, is that you have to open yourself up to people's criticism and um, ask people for help. There is a fallacy that, that writing is a solitary endeavour. It starts inside you, it, it, it's solitary in the first instance, but it becomes very collaborative if you want it to be. There's a lot of people you can talk to and people you can trust and people who've been down the same road and have useful things to say. So you have to open yourself up to collaboration and take on board what you're told. There's no point um, asking someone to look at your work and then saying, uh, yeah, that's a bit offensive, I didn't particularly like that. Um, so on the one hand, this doggedness about backing yourself, and on the other hand, I guess a kind of humility about taking on board what people think. And, and if you can balance the two things, then you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, and you get there. Yeah, that's very wise. That's exactly what it is. Um, thank you, Jack, for a great discussion. Thanks, Pop Sarah. But published by Text Publishing, The Burning Island can be purchased online from Dimmicks Australia or any of our excellent local bookshops offering online ordering, which we've been so lucky to have over the last few months. Uh, copies of the book are also available to borrow from the Geelong Regional Libraries in e-versions and hard copy. The library has 22 hard copies on order and already 21 holds, so you need to get in fast. Um, if you're a member, you might like to take advantage of the library's new click and deliver home delivery service, which you can access through the website, which is an amazing service. Shout out to our libraries. Um, Jacques, uh, before I wrap up and end the broadcast, uh, I'm giving you an opportunity to say good night to the many, nearly 100 people who are with us tonight. I would love to do that. Um, good night to everybody. And I'd like to say a couple of little shout outs, if I may, Sarah. Um, my dear family who um, have gathered around a screen to watch Hello. <laughs> um, and to all of the people at Text who've helped me out. Um, 
And uh, as I said, I didn't do this alone, this storytelling. There's in the back of the Burning Island, I've set out a whole list of people who were generous and helpful to me in getting this book together. And I'm extremely grateful to him. Um, and to you, Sarah, thanks heaps for, for taking me through this. I've really enjoyed it. It's lovely of you. I'm just bathing in your reflected glory. I'm so excited. <laughs> Get out of town. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. On behalf of the library, thank you all for joining us uh, tonight and have a good one. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Sarah.